So I'm happy to have Drew and I give this uh, Uganda trip report. And we'll just be going through the, the trip that we took to Uganda uh, in January of this year with Elton, our passport winner, and a Nicar Nicaraguan coffee producer, as well as um, a couple of clients. So without further ado, Okay, so Uganda, is, the bulk of Uganda's coffee uh, is produced by smallholder farmers working on less than two and a half hectares. And while it's historically known as um, the progenitor of Robusta along with DR Congo, uh, we've noticed that there are some standout Arabica areas, um, specifically in the east, uh, Mount Elgon region, right here up here in the West Nile and down uh, in the Southwest in the Renzori Mountains. And where Drew and I will be focusing this uh, presentation is this uh, Renzori area. And the Conzo Joint was our first visit this time, which is about a six hour, six to eight hour drive uh, west from the capital of Kampala. So this is zoomed in to where uh, the Konzo joint is located. And where my mouse is right here is Kasese, which is the largest town in the region. Uh, but the Konzo joint is uh, very spread out with its farmers. And so you'll note that the Chirumba, the town that we visited, uh, the headquarters is this little yellow star here, and that's where Bukonzo Joint has its dry mill, its roasting and storage facilities. It's we can't see your cursor, and then one by the way. Oh, okay, good to know. Um, so the in the little group of three on the right-hand side is where Bukonzo Joint's headquarters is located in the town of Chirumba, um, and then the middle of the three ones is St. Gourette, one of the washing stations. And just to give you kind of a, the, the distance between those is probably a 15, 10 minute motorcycle ride and a, well, an hour and a half walk. Uh, and then there's another uh, washing station that's called Kiando and Bebo that is on the left of those. Um, and then in the far upper side of that, that other yellow is another washing station we visited called Nia Basusi. And so that probably is about a two hour drive from the rest of uh, the, the washing stations over here. So uh, Bukonzo Joint has about 20 washing stations, micro washing stations because of the mountainous terrain in the area. Okay. This is the town of Chirumba. Uh, um, it's where the headquarters are located. Electricity is sporadic but it's much better than in years past. It's not paved uh, generally, and uh, it has a very small town feel. And just to give an idea of what the town looks like from the surrounding region, this is probably about a 30 minute hike. So you can see the size of it for perspective. Okay, so this is... Um, and they have invested quite heavily in their own milling and storage facilities um, and the vertical integration allows them to maintain control over quality and we think they have one of the best labs in all of Uganda along with very qualified lab staff. Um, one reason why we think they've been so successful is their emphasis on gender inclusion which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, they they work on something called GALS, a uh, gender action learning system. And it's a way to uh, really promote gender equity at the family, you know, household community and kind of wider level. And they use this as a tool. It's not just a, a talking point. Um, so in 2015, Atlas and some of our roaster clients jointly funded an on-site cupping lab, which is within this building here. Um, and six staff from Bukonzo Joint spent a week training with Drew on the basics of lab management, sample roasting, and cupping, and their enthusiasm and, and eagerness have allowed us really to, um, 
to improve and they've been one of our most inspiring partners uh, and Drew will talk a little bit about the the training that we did this year. Okay, so I'll pass it off to Drew. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, to to introduce the training uh, session, I also wanted to draw attention just to the people of Pecanza Joint because uh, I think that makes it more real. These are people that Susan and I and Jen have spent a lot of time with over the years. Um, and the people who make this go. And really, it, it is the relationships uh, that we're about here. So over the last few years, as Susan mentioned, I've gone and done training with the quality control uh, team at Bacconza Joint. And really, uh, if you're thinking about Nicaragua or other Latin American regions, often there are like qualified QC professionals that like a mill could hire, they could put out an, an employment ad like, you know, like here and say, hey, we need cuppers, you know, for our lab. Uh, in Chirimba, uh, that there's not that pool of, of uh, resources. So basically over the past several years, we've been training key personnel there that they have identified that they thought would make a, a, a possible QC team. And like Susan mentioned, the, um, the emphasis on, uh, Gender balance is also uh, quite visible in their lab staff as well. So Susan, if you if you'd advance the slide. Um, so these are two of their cuppers. Uh, on the right, you have Salome, who is actually the lab manager there, and she's a badass. She's uh, really awesome at what she does there, and and just kind of keeping everyone uh, in the team on track. And then on the left is Maxine who is part of the cupping team from the beginning there, but also he's kind of their general like handyman, like keeps everything working and running and, and good order uh, there at Bacconzo Joint. So really a lot of these people wear a lot of hats. They're all coffee producers. Uh, so they're growing their own coffee. They're a part of a washing station. Uh, they work here in the lab, they do uh, a lot of things. I don't know how they keep uh, them all straight. Uh, next slide. And then here on the right, you have Alosio, who is also a member of the cupping team, uh, and John, who um, we we who have traveled there at least have a great fondness for. And you may have heard um, about the the fundraising for the school among the many hats that John wears. Um, he also runs and administrates a, a local uh, private school uh, for kids in the area. And uh, Susan and Kate from Bridgehead have really spearheaded raising some money um, because the government was going to close down their school if they uh, didn't have the resources to build uh, latrines and some other things. Uh, so these are two more of the cupping staff that I've spent time with over the last few years. And the next slide. Um, here on the right, uh, in the foreground, is Gloria, who has been one of the cuppers from early on. And she, incidentally, is also the daughter of Pinetto, who's the managing director. And then in the background there is Anna, who is the newer cupper to the team, um, yeah, more recently. And then on the left-hand side is Aceza, who has been uh, one of the cuppers from early on. And I realized after I got back, I don't have a picture. There's another new team member um, named Jovia. So she's not pictured here, but she's also uh, a member of the cupping team. And they, they've learned not only uh, to cup with uh, great skill and ease, and they're calibrated pretty well with us, um, but they also do a very similar thing to what we do in our cupping panel, where they all uh, give individual scores and average them to create their official score. So they're, they're doing all that stuff in, in their lab in Churumba. Next slide. And then these are two key leaders in the organization. Uh, Pinetto on the left is the managing director who uh, is such a wise soul uh, and, and a good leader for the community. And then on the right uh, is Medras, and uh, she's like his right-hand woman, um, handles the, the finance side of things and generally keeps it all together. And she's an amazing 
person as well. So next slide. This year, um, the the lab team, I didn't, past years I've spent as much as three days training with them and really they, they know how to run a lab uh, at this point. Um, but in past years, our training on sample roasting had been cut short due to technical difficulties and those have finally all been ironed out. Um, so I spent uh, a focused time with them training on both um, sample roasting quality control um, based on weight loss. <clears throat> and also the morning was spent uh, doing uh, maintenance and cleaning. We took the sample roaster all apart and cleaned it. And I showed them how to troubleshoot certain things if they were having certain problems. Um, and then instead of in past years where I've roasted all the samples for the competition, and the goal here was to get them up to speed on sample roasting and then to have them roast all of the samples for this year's cupping competition and for that to be on their plate going forward because why should we be roasting their samples they they uh they'll be doing that from from now on and that was kind of the goal to get them up to speed with that which went uh really great this year and they did all the roasting and all the roasts came out uh just just great for the cupping purposes so next slide Okay, so doing roasting training with the lab staff, the rest of us uh, actually participated in a vision journey workshop, which is one of the many GALS tools. And uh, if you have uh, worked with Atlas for a while, you may have read something about GALS. You may have participated in a workshop. We, many of us, even at Atlas, have used some of these tools. I have a vision journey sitting at my desk right now um, just to do planning. And so it's a way that uh, Buconzo Joint has really been a pioneer in not only gender equity among its members, but they use these tools in a very practical way at the family level, but also at uh, individual washing station level. And then at their general assembly, all of the washing stations come together and bring their vision tools and they talk about the commonalities and come up with, with a, a vision for the whole cooperative each year. And, and work on refining that. So uh, if you're not familiar with a vision journey, I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, so the, the first step involves drawing in the lower left-hand corner. Um, oh, uh, just a second. Uh, oh, sorry. In the lower left-hand corner, the, um, you draw your current situation of any given um, scenario. And, and then in the upper right hand corner where the sun is, you draw what you hope to achieve in one to five years. So in Mukonzo Joint's case, you can see them picking uh, green cherries, unripe cherries on the lower left hand side. Uh, and in the upper right hand side, it has men and women working together to pick ripe cherries. Um, and then, and this is an uncompleted uh, vision journey right now, but the, the basics are there. Um, and then in the upper hand, upper hand, like the top part of the paper, you draw what your uh, resources are. And then the lower half, you draw what your uh, challenges are. And then in the middle, kind of between the two big circles, you draw each action step that you will use. Um, and what was a really neat thing to see with our group is that we had a Nicaraguan farmer producer, we had, um, you know, roaster from Canada, Bridgehead, roaster from uh, the Seattle area, um, uh, Victrola, and then an importer, myself, and then coffee producers, and we all did our own vision journeys, and then we talked about the commonalities, and that talking about the commonalities in the vision journey was something that I had never done in previous trainings in order to inform, you know, how we were going to work together as a supply chain. Um, Pinetto led the training along with some of the members of that washing station and he said um, he said there's a big mountain between producers and buyers and we must both climb to the top uh, in his wise in his wise ways and gals is just one of those ways that you know producers and buyers uh, are are meeting at the summit so that was a really um, great experience and then moving on I'll let drew talk about 
So as you know, uh, this year, for the first time ever, we tried a, a dual continent, intercontinental cupping competition. Uh, and as a result, we winnowed out um, some of the uh, lesser samples at Atlas prior to uh, our journey to Churumba. Uh, so we had fewer coffees to, to cup than usual. Um, and there you see all the members of our team uh, part of the cupping panel, um, doing the cupping. And um, that went so smoothly. Not only did we have less coffees, but uh, electricity is better. They have a generator now. And the lab staff is just total, they are total professionals. So everything just went like clockwork there, which was beautiful to see, actually. It's kind of the most rewarding thing of the whole experience is for me to see several years on how how pro they are uh, at running their own lab. Um, so we cupped the coffees and uh, discussed them and um, had the placing. And then we averaged our scores in Churumba with the scores that uh, were generated by the Seattle cupping. In addition, we had a bonus round that you all didn't have in Seattle because in order to make the Seattle cupping work, we had to have them finish lots that could ship, uh, that the samples could ship to us in December and stop collecting on those lots at, at that time. So then we had sort of what were called late harvest lots that they collected, you know, probably from December onward uh, that we up there on location. Uh, so that was fun too, seeing another round of samples uh, and was kind of a bonus for those who actually got to travel to Churumba this year. Uh, so that was our cupping competition for this year. Great. And um, Drew will talk a moment in additional training he did. Um, but while he was doing this processing training that he'll talk about, um, Dennis uh, from Victrola and I headed to Kasese to do some latte uh, latte art milk texture training and really it was Dennis that did this training and I I was the photographer uh, because he has great skills in, in teaching so Bukonzo Joint also has a facility in Kasese and about an hour's drive away from Churumba and this facility has historically been a space to do additional sorting um, to dry extra drying for coffee that might be too wet when it arrives as parchment um, or has been milled up at the mill in Churumba. And then uh, last year when we came, they had just uh, built this beautiful cafe to serve the community. Um, so they, they had their soft opening last year and it's a space uh, really for the community members to come and to have coffee. Uh, and so uh, we continued and they really wanted to do latte art as, as many of us do because it's fun. So, uh, we spent three to four hours uh, focusing on the basics of espresso again, and then uh, doing the fun part of latte art. So uh, let me get through these. Some of these notes were from last year when Drew and Kate from Ridgehead did did the what we elaborated on, or I should say, Dennis elaborated on was. Uh, really dialing in steaming milk because we kept saying if you want to have good latte art you have to have good milk and people caught on really fast and we talked about the stretch and then the role of the milk and how long to do this in order to do latte art so if you're ever in the Kasese area i highly recommend stopping by the cafe in Kasese. it has the most beautiful artwork on the ceiling too of all the different steps of processing and cherry production um and it's really neat to see how how multifaceted Bukonzo joint has becoming without without overdoing themselves. Um. Um, so the the uh, where we stay when we're in the town of Churumba are these guest cottages that are right next to the cooperative uh, grounds, but they're owned by a, a separate uh, person in the community. Um, so there are these little kind of thatched roof houses that we stay in. And they didn't have this at first, but maybe last year they finished construction on a bar, which you can see in the background. So it's a separate building. Uh, and you can 
you can drink inside, but usually when we came to the grounds of the bar, they just carried a plastic table. They would come running with chairs and tables and set up a nice place uh, for us. And this was our, our daily ritual after a long day of, of working and whatever we were doing or traveling around to washing stations was to come to the uh, guest house bar uh, and uh, debrief and have a few brews. So there's, there's the team there. <clears throat> so in past years, I had put a lot of effort into the QC training, and um, this year I thought the best way to add value would be to kind of go upstream. So one of the things we've concentrated on with the QC team is recognizing problems uh, so that they can respond to them before the coffee gets to us. And what I mean by that is if they're receiving coffee that's moldy or defective or tastes baggy already or whatever, they can channel that coffee away from Atlas so that our clients don't get it. Uh, and also they can communicate to the washing station and say, hey, you're having a mold problem, do something about it, right? So we have that piece in place, but going further upstream, how do we prevent the mold problems from happening to begin with? And that's about processing. Uh, so I put together this processing training based on um, what I've learned in the Q processing program and other experiences. Uh, and I, I went about it with a bit of trepidation because, you know, I've never taught it before. Uh, I didn't know how, I tried to envision how to carry this out most effectively on the ground in Chirumba. Uh, but I didn't know until I let it, how it was going to go. And it really went swimmingly. I think uh, it all came off according to plan. It was beneficial uh, for their team members uh, and definitely a great, a great learning experience for me as well. Um, so we basically ran this uh, in sort of two half day segments. We started on a Sunday afternoon and they had, they had organized for Cherry to deliver to this new washing station that conveniently is located right on the grounds of the, the main grounds of the cooperative. Uh, and what that meant was that it was very convenient to the classroom. When I originally conceived of this class, I imagined teaching it in a remote location without PowerPoint, but I actually was, uh, was able, and I didn't find this out until I was there in Tarumba, that I was able to have access to the, the lab classroom there, which meant at the last moment in the evenings during the competition and all that other stuff, I was actually furiously putting PowerPoint presentations together on the fly <laughs> from my notes. Um, and I think that really helped uh, aid in the instruction as well. So the first day we focused on uh, learning around um, Allow our, around pulping and fermentation. Uh, and, you know, in a lot of ways, they know processing better than I do. So really I wanted to, I wanted to facilitate seeing exactly what they do and how they handle their coffee uh, and learning from them. Uh, and what I was really hoping to add was the benefit of measuring and taking records, because I knew that that was not something that they were doing uh, it's not something that a lot of producers do, and getting into that habit empowers them to actually head off problems before they happen, to know what works and what doesn't work in their particular uh, circumstances. Um, so we went over um, fermentation and things that can be measured, including pH and temperature throughout the time that coffee is fermenting. And we practice taking those readings. Um, and uh, so this is a few pictures from the first day when we were receiving cherry. Also, coffee needs to be weighed at every step in the process so that we know how much weight is lost at every step. So you can see that's Maxine, who is a member of the cupping team, but also general all around helping things to run smoothly person, uh, helping to weigh the, the cherry. And then on the right, you see everyone working together and everyone's dressed up in fancy clothes and then they're down there um, picking all the overripes and underripes by hand. And this is one of the things that I, I learned uh, 
that was so striking to me, and you'll see from some of the pictures here, um, compared to El Salvador, Nicaragua, other places, it's just so labor intensive. There is no, they don't have the facility and the infrastructure to do any of these steps in an easy or convenient way. So people are, you know, bent over or sitting on the ground by hand, picking out all the overripes and underripes. And yes, this was a class, but this is also how it is done for our customers when they receive this coffee. So Susan, can you advance the slide? And then we uh, we we did floating of the coffee. And so again, all the coffee has moved by hand. I mean, think about the ergonomics of that in little baskets like that green one there on the left, where she's picking up a batch of that coffee, dumping it into another bucket that's full of water and swishing it around and skimming all the floaters off the top. It's all done in small batches by hand. And then loaded by hand, as you see on the right, into the pulping machine. One of my concerns was that maybe the pulpers would not be calibrated well, so we tested that as well. And uh, their pulper is, is awesome. I mean, it, it was not splitting or breaking anything. There were no good beans going into the, the pulp stream. Uh, it was very clean, good pulping. So that was nice to see in the process. Next slide. So they're pulping there without water, and this pulper is set up to do that, um, which is good. It becomes a joint, and it's generally, you know, more and more important all around the world to use less water. They don't have a really good way of efficiently delivering water to the site where they're pulping, and also they have very limited means to treat wastewater. So the less less water that they use in general, the better. Next slide. And then uh, what we did as part of our experiment was take the lot that we had created of, of, and split it into two different batches. Uh, and all the fermentation there happens in plastic buckets, basically. So it's, again, very small, very labor intensive. These are the kind of buckets that they use. Uh, we divided the lot into two. And with one of them, we did a dry fermentation. You can see that in the back there in the blue uh, bucket. And then in the green bucket, it was a wet fermentation underwater, so that we're taking pH and temperature readings from both of them and seeing how they're different. Because everything up till they were split was exactly the same, but the fermentation took place differently <laughs> because of those variables. And then on the um, right-hand side, you can see those buckets are covered, and these are our records kept in Ziploc so that they're safe. Uh, but the records of the process that both of these lots went through. And we checked them. So this uh, this was ready at this state in the buckets, probably something around 5 p.m. in the evening. So we checked the readings at this point. Um, we also checked them later on in the evening before bed. And then we checked them uh, again the next morning and then in the afternoon, and then we washed them. All right, next slide. So this slide was meant to be a video, but we couldn't get the video to be working. And again, it's just an illustration of how incredibly labor intensive everything that they do is. Uh, so when the fermentation was complete, which was about 18 hours uh, at the time that we took our measurements and we saw that the mucilage was completely broken down, it was time to wash the coffee. Um, which is another thing that was really beneficial for them because they didn't really have a good means in the past of, of deciding when was the right time to rinse and wash the coffee to end the fermentation. And so uh, we talked about how to determine the end point uh, as well. And then when they wash the coffee and literally they have a bucket full of the fermenting coffee they pour that light blue bucket of water on top and with their arms, you know, stir it around in the bucket and then they have to pour it out and strain it. And then they pour another round of fresh water on it, stir it around again for our ants and strain it. So, I mean, imagine doing this at home. I mean, it, it is a lot of work and the outturn of that is something like 20 kilos of parchment. 
So we spent hours, in fact, basically a day and a half working on what was 20 kilos of parchment. <laughs> so next slide. And then uh, we had a whole other session, uh, PowerPoint about drying and parameters to look for and be aware of in the drying, what to measure, uh, measuring ambient temperature, measuring the temperature of the coffee beans, and what ranges of temperature you should try and keep the coffee in uh, during its drying period. We also talked about weight loss. Uh, most of these, well, really none of the washing stations have a, an accurate way of checking moisture to know when the coffee is actually down to 12%. So it's a continual problem because they are remote and they have to carry by hand all of the coffee down to Bacomzo joint uh, when it's finished drying to deliver it to the cooperative. And oftentimes coffee gets delivered that's 13% or more, and then Bacomzo joint has to, do, has to dry it again to get it down to 11% or whatever, because uh, the washing stations just don't have a way of accurately measuring it. They can kind of approximate so we talked about a way to get pretty close to, to being certain that coffee was ready by measuring weight loss. If they know the weight of the coffee in wet parchment, they can do figures to figure out how much weight loss uh, it should be at when it's dry parchment that's ready to be delivered to the cooperative. So we talked about that in the presentation. Uh, and then we laid our coffee out to dry and took measurements. Uh, and again, everyone, it's a very, everything's done as a community there. So everyone's working, everyone's chipping in. Uh, they're picking uh, some defect beans out of the parchment as it's laid out to dry. Next slide. Another thing we wanted to talk about is just every time we go to Bacones Joint, we are so, um, amazed and, and ourselves inspired and motivated by the fact that they're constantly improving. And uh, one of the things that had been flagged in the past is how, uh, so in the picture on the left, you see their mill and warehouse. And in the past, until this year, it was only that brick building, the only the part of it uh, on the left-hand side of the picture on the left. And uh, the mill operation is in there and there's storage, but their storage was very haphazard. They didn't have bags labeled very well. You would, and they didn't have them stacked in a very orderly fashion. So you would see just, sort of, oh, that, that area over there is kind of the area where, where we store the coffee from St. Gourette. And that, that corner over there is the coffee uh, from Butale, but who knows how they're kind of intermingling and whatnot. So we talked about the importance of organizing the warehouse, nice clean stacks, labeling everything. And this year, they were proud to show us that they had built a new addition to the warehouse, which doesn't have walls yet. I don't know if they're planning on building walls, um, but you can see it in the picture there. And they took us through and showed us their organization. Everything stacked super neatly. And they have every stack labeled with all the information that you see there on the right. Uh, which is maybe even more information that they need than they need. It's it's pretty incredible uh, how they're labeling everything. And I asked, if you see down the bottom, it says score 85.33. And then below that, it says SCA 85.5. And I was like, what's the difference between score and SCAA? And they said, oh, SCAA is your score from Atlas. Uh, so number one, they're giving our score a lot of uh, credibility. Uh, but number two, look how close those those marks are. So their team scored this particular lot 85.33, and our team scored at 85.5. So really good calibration there. Next slide. In other new things, a, a, a consistent challenge there has been drying uh, because the climate is often rainy and humid uh, and even hailing with significant hail uh, during the time that they need to dry the coffee. And there's often not adequate space for drying. But um, they received funding from a nonprofit organization to, uh, for one of the washing stations, Naya Basusi, that you saw pictured in the map, if you remember the one that was sort of further out, uh, to build 
a whole bunch of drawing tables. And they actually, I did calculations and uh, according to the volume that they normally receive, they now actually have enough drying space to technically dry it according to best protocols. So um, that was great to see. And then the mill got a color sorter. So they have a brand spanking new shiny color sorter. A lot of hand sorting takes place there, but they now can get a little more efficient and use this machine for hand sorting. So constant improvements always being made. Um, it's become traditional for us to take the buyers uh, after being very rustic and not having uh, hot water or even any water at some point in our in our cabins uh, to spend some one day at Mwea Lodge and go on a little safari. Uh, and this year we got super close to the elephants, which was awesome and a little bit scary. <laughs> so that's just a picture, a uh, very up close picture uh, of an elephant, as you can see, of course. <laughs> Also, to keep things interesting, uh, so I usually in the past I've planned one training. This year I planned three trainings, and also Dennis did a, Dennis and Susan did a, a fourth training. So lots of trainings going on this year. Um, in addition to the training at Becomes a Joint, um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Nandi, who can see in the foreground with the burgundy shirt. Uh, she was a, a former Q student and now is the director of, of operations at AFCA in Kampala, asked me if I could do a Q calibration uh, in Kampala since I was in town. And uh, they really have, CQI has a problem uh, getting enough calibrations for cuppers to stay, Q graders to stay calibrated and stay current in Africa. Uh, so AFCA really wanted to put one on and uh, and we at Atlas really wanted to contribute to helping that problem of there not being enough uh, calibrations to keep Q graders current in East Africa. So we put one on, and this was my final day. Um, I had one day to prep for it in Kampala, and then uh, one day to carry it out, and then my flight left at midnight, basically this night of the calibration. So it was supposed to be from nine to five, and I was supposed to get at the airport at like 8.30 or something like that to fly out. And this was almost an entire disaster. It was really a, basically a train wreck. Uh, even though we did everything we could ahead of time to organize and head off this problem and make sure we had enough cuppers, because CQI requires a minimum of six people. And we had six people. But then some basically, long story short, some African politics between organizations um, meant that a bunch of cuppers pulled out. And we were left with only four or maybe five. We basically last minute scrambled five people together and got a remote blessing from uh, CQI to run the course with five people. And yet waiting for all that to take place and everyone to get on the site and to uh, get the approval from CQI. And it was like one o'clock before we got started with the calibration. So it ran from one to 8.30. And then I jumped into a car and raced to the airport <laughs> and flew out of the country. Uh, so that was very stressful. But the calibration went off swimmingly once it started. Uh, it was quite a way to uh, spend my last few hours in Uganda this year. Uh, so that this was kind of like a choose your own adventure ending to our trip because I spent the last two days in Kampala at AFCA while Susan actually went elsewhere during this time and we met up uh, at the airport at the end. Back to you, Susan. Thanks, Drew. So um, before I talk about Mount Elgon, um, I, when Drew was doing his processing training, um, Dennis from Victrola and I went and visited Rizori Farmers Cooperative Union down the road from Bukonzo Joint. And actually, they, the two groups uh, get along great, and Bukonzo Joint does the milling for RFCU. Um, so RFCU is also a, a un, an umbrella cooperative so it's a union um, kind of overseeing 
16 primary societies or primary cooperatives, and they are working to produce specialty uh, natural Arabica. So whereas Bucanto Joint now does only all washed Arabica, RFCU is doing natural. Um, and if you have spent any time in Uganda, um, driving alongside the roads, everyone's drying berries of you know yellow, green, any any color on the ground, on the dirt, maybe on tarps. Um, well, this group is really trying to raise the bar and has washing stations or drying stations where it's all, they're drying their cherry on raised beds. Um, and they also have uh, vanilla and cocoa. So they started as a vanilla cooperative, um, but they encourage their members to do at least two of the three crops between vanilla, cocoa, and coffee because they intercrop well and it's also good risk management. Um, so about two thirds of their 3,200 members uh, do coffee. And um, here is an example of one of the smaller drying stations. So each primary cooperative has a drying station um, and then the, the umbrella cooperative of RFCU also has some additional drying space closer to Kasese. Um, and let's see, um, just wanted to share a little bit because I think it's interesting about vanilla. It's such a risky crop that um, you will see, I am sorry, I don't have a picture of it here, but you will see that people will use dried banana leaves to uh, uh, you know, resurrect fences. And I asked the members, uh, you know, why why do you put dried banana leaves on your fences when you have vanilla? Because can, thieves can see that you have vanilla. They said it's to prevent people from seeing the exact moment when the vanilla is flowering, so that thieves don't then they'll come back 90 days later or whatever. It's about three, two, you know, two or three months later, and they'll know when to harvest the vanilla. So people will sleep out in their fields uh, to protect their, their vanilla. There's actually been people that have been killed, thieves and uh, producers. So while it's a very, very um, lucrative crop to grow, uh, farmers definitely have been, you know, they'll, they'll grow many other crops because, you know, I visited one producer and all of her vanilla had been stolen. So, um, and there are strict rules in Uganda about when you can be seen harvesting vanilla so, uh, to, to try to mitigate uh, thefts. So it's just kind of an interesting, um, you know, focus at this group. Uh, they are fair trade organic certified in vanilla and passive and fair trade certified in cocoa and coffee and passively organic. And this is Dviko. He's a field officer at RFCU and he um, took Dennis and I around and we had a, um, a great visit with a lot of the producers. We actually were caught in a, you know, a absolute downpour that lasted know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So we got an extended time to talk to a member and then we, we left her house and the rain started pouring down again. And he said, you know, let's come in here. And we go into his house. And I thought it was another member. And he's like, no, no, this is just a, a random member of the community. She doesn't sell to RFCU yet. And so this woman had these strangers in her house and we had a, a nice chance to talk to her. Um, and what we're really excited about with this group, along with just their enthusiasm and their desire also to improve quality, um, because I should mention this is, we're buying their, their first container um, ever of exported coffee. So they're really motivated. Um, they've, they've been producing coffee, but just sold it internally. Um, th this is a, a picture of the pre-shipment score, which uh, scored 83.25, but the espresso was really nice with chocolatey notes, um, grape, cherry. It was, um, it's a profile that a lot of our clients like for, you know, a, a, a single origin espresso or as an espresso component. So um, we're excited to grow this relationship and really excited about the potential. So it's, it's, it was neat to visit Bacanzo Joint, which has been a long-term relationship and then spend more time with a newer, um, you know, relationship from a group that, you know, was only founded in 2016 and is, is uh, a little bit younger, so at a different stage. Um, 
And then heading east, while Drew was doing his training with AFCA, I headed to Mount Elgon Agroforestry Communities Cooperative, say that three times fast. Um, so I'm just going to be referencing it as MIAC, which is how, how they say it. And this is on, on the far east in the Mount Elgon area. And they have a really interesting story, too, because this group, um, let me fast forward a slide. So here is a picture of Luke, uh, the, the director of operations there. Um, and we've worked with him before. And uh, this is a picture of part of Mount Elgon. It's this huge sprawling mountain with many, many coffee buyers, multinationals, cooperatives. It's, it's uh, known for its wash coffee. So this group is Fair Trade Organic certified doing wash coffee. And uh, it was formed, MIAC was formed in 2017, but uh, it, in many ways it has the, the energy of a much even younger startup um, because many of the members were part of a now defunct um, cooperative called Gumitundo, who, who for a variety of reasons collapsed uh, years ago. And then many of the members kind of, it got resurrected as this group. Um, and so uh, they've been working with um, exporters and uh, partners. And this last year they decided, hey, we're, we're gonna try to export um, on our own. And they were very motivated working with limited resources, but they were able to get an export license. They were able to, um, you know, apply for funding from um, social lender bank and and have it come through and kind of everything can they they rented out a space and they were working on kind of a shoestring budget with really dedicated employees um, and so it's really neat to it was neat to visit them at this time where everything was coming together for them and we're also very excited about um, you know seeing where this will go. Um, so up above, this is a picture of John, their QC manager. They're meticulously, um, they, they're using a moisture meter when they receive samples. Um, this is also an umbrella cooperative. So there's um, many cooperatives underneath. Um, let me see here if I have actually more information specifically on the amount of, there's about a dozen, but I can get the actual numbers to you, um, cooperatives underneath. And then the picture below is the, they're renting, it's a former uh, soap factory in the town of Mbale, which is, if you, if you go to Mbale, it's, it's a couple hours from Mount Eldon, and it's where a lot of groups have their mills and their, um, their factories, and any shipment even from the west of Uganda comes through Kampala and through Mbale on its way out to Mombasa. So it's kind of a... Um, you'll see a lot of different coffee groups. So they're renting a former soap factory um, to do all of their QC and their storage. Um, and then if, if coffee is too, too wet, they have additional drying space and they have their hand sorters here. Um, and, then, and then one interesting thing is that they, they don't, they're much like uh, Bokanzo Joint, there's just, limited infrastructure, even even more limited. Um, many people do not have space for drying tables. So people, this is farmer wash coffee. Um, and so, which means that they don't have even micro washing stations. They're doing all the washing at uh, the household level or the community level. So people, if they're lucky, will have trays like this in their houses that they can bring outside and move around. Um, Many others are drying parchment on tarps. Uh, and then only about, I think it was about 10% of the members own um, hand. If, if, the, if the pulper looked small that Drew had pictures of, this is even smaller. It's a hand pulper and it, it's a lot of work. They had me try it just to try. Um, and I'm gonna try to do a YouTube video here. So you can see uh, it's a lot of work to crank that thing. And so okay, let me get this back. Okay, and so you can see that uh, you know the members will rent their their pulpers to other members um, for a small fee. And uh, the amount of work is just is tremendous. I was sweating after, you know, I, 
I, I would probably not not make it as a coffee farmer. I was I was sweating after a few cranks. Um, these are some of the the members of the group. They have a really strong small leadership team. So Fema here um, in the lower right hand corner. She's the general manager. Um, and then uh, uh, I was able to meet Jennifer. She is on the the board of director directors, this is, um, or she's on the leadership team, as well as this picture up above is Jennifer's house. So we hung out with her, got to um, see some of her coffee trees and how she dries her coffee. And when I said, oh, where, you know, where are the, are the drying tables? She said, oh, you know, I, I, I'm only able to dry, um, you know, on my house right now at, on TARP. So they're doing the best they can also with limited um, infrastructure, but we were really happy to see the quality that they're able to do by their you know, picking ripe cherry, they're really uh, intensive quality control. And and just their enthusiasm, um, you know, uh, using what they have, they uh, don't have a lab yet, but they're so eager to to get one, but they're, they know they have to do one step at a time. So um, they're really working on, instead of just having this top heavy leadership, they're, they said people are sharing information, they're talking, um, because they'd been through quite a bit with, um, you know, being through a cooperative that collapsed, they, they've they learned a lot of lessons. So I think it will be, and we're really hopeful to see, you know, what, what comes out of this and excited to, to get, uh, ha see our shipment arrive. Um, so that is the end of this presentation and we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll look forward to the next one. I'm going to see if I can... Thank you, guys.